things. But people in the church do matter. We have all kinds. And so we're going to deal with some of those. And some of their names I find very hard to pronounce. And so we're just going to bypass them very quickly. Okay? That's it. I used to just say hard word. <laughs> yeah, I just went, you now hard word. Yeah, that, that gets it. <laughs> but today we're going to look at people matter, and it's really important that we understand what happens in the church. Now, Paul's writing to the church at Romans. He's bringing it to a conclusion, and he's thanking people who have impacted his life in one form or another. And so he, he, he's telling the Romans to treat these people with kindness, with love, with respect, and all the things that Christians do for each other. And so they don't need to be suspicious of them. Just bear with them. So he, he mentions them by name. So the first thing he says to us is that we need to remember that people make up the church. Believe it or not, people do make up the church. Some will keep, keep you mad. Some will keep you glad. But people make up the church. And Paul outlines this in verses 1 through 15. I'm going to read some of this to you, and then I'm just going to guide you through it. I commend you, I commend you our sister Phoebe, for is, uh, who is a servant of the church, which is at wherever that is, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of. For she herself has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. So he talks about Phoebe and how much she has helped them along the way. And they, they want them to, to treat her with respect. And all these people are going to Rome ahead of Paul. And they're going to be there when he gets there. He talks about uh, Prisca and Aquila. I personally believe that's probably Priscilla and Aquila. But he calls them Prisca and Aquila. Uh, they're fellow workers in Christ. And so they, he wants them to treat them with kindness. Uh, uh, because uh, the church meets in their house and they want them to be encouraged that's why we need to encourage each other i do i do, I do my best to try to encourage james over here it's pretty hard at times but you just have to encourage them along the way it's so important that we encourage one another but he goes on talks about mary uh and andronicus and unias and and people of that nature he, he has a whole list of people that he just talks about all the way through verses 11, and then you get to verse 12, you have more, and 13, you have more, 14, you have more, 15, you have more. And these are all people who served with Paul in one form or another, and he loved them. He probably led most of them to the Lord, and so they've come to know him, and they really love him. And so he wants them to treat them with kindness. And so then we need to be sure that uh, the need in the church it's, uh, the need to be uh, greeted in the church is great. We need to greet each other. Uh, a pastor friend of mine says, we never preach to the empty chairs. We always preach to the chairs that are full. And uh, when I was interim pastor of a church in Blue Ridge, we had 250 chairs in the auditorium and 18 people. It's kind of hard to focus on that. But you always preach to those that are in the chairs. And then they start to build themselves up as long as they don't have a fight. But anyway, that's the way it is. But, we need, but there's a need to be greeted. And we need to greet each other. I like it when churches greet each other. And they take time to greet each other. And they share with each other in their services. And he says, uh, greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh, and that needs to be clarified. All the churches of Christ greet you. A holy kiss does not mean a, a lip-smacking kiss. It means cheek to cheek. And so he says, just greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, with Flora, I take it a little further, but with you folks, I'm going to be a little more cautious. Y'all didn't laugh at that at all. And then there is a need in the church for recognition. People need to be recognized for what they do. And it's important because people need it. The Lord built that into us, a need for recognition. And I, I know people that have left the church quicker than any, anybody I've ever known over the, over the fact that no one recognized what they did and they were hurt. Was it, was it wrong for them to leave? Probably so. But if they had been recognized, they probably wouldn't have left. So you have to look at it from, from two points. 
In verses 17 to 19, he says, Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching, to the teaching which you learn, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their own smooth and fluttering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. And so he's commending them for what they've done. But he also tells them to watch out. Watch out for people who cause trouble and dissension. There are people in the church that do that. You know, years ago uh, when I was pastoring, we, our church had, had grown just a tremendous amount. And there was another church in town that was a little, had a little difficult problem. And so uh, the, the, they, they split and, and the people from the split came over to our church. And uh, I knew who they were when I saw them. I was warned that they would be there. And so I knew also that they were the ones who had caused some trouble in that particular church. And so I, I asked them to meet me in my office after services that day. And we would talk about some things that were necessary. And so they met with me in their office. And I just simply explained to them, you left because you don't like your pastor, right? And they said, yes. I said, well, you're not going to like me either. <laughs> because I'm about as straightforward as you're going to find anywhere. So you're not going to be happy with me either. But I've got a proposition for you. We need another church on the other side of town where there is no church. You can go over there. I've got a building that you can rent over there. And it, it would be your church. You would have your church, your people. Everything will be yours. We will even pay for your pastor for the first year, provide you with Sunday school literature and hymn books if you'll go start your own church. And they liked that idea. And so they did. They went over, started their own church. 25 years later, I was invited back to do a revival in that church. They'd grown quite well. They, they fought a little bit, but they were doing quite well. Their pastor was a, a young man that I ordained as a, as a deacon in our church. And so he became the pastor there. Great man of God, beautiful family. And uh, they loved him. And so sometimes we need to do that. But we have to understand that people cause trouble. And they should be avoided. You don't need troublemakers in the church. So you need to find a way to move them on or to move them around or to isolate them. Again, the church that I had in, in the South was a, was a beautiful building. It had a lovely place. But the church was started as a split. It continued as a split. It fought as a split. And it seemed like every time they got up to about 85 they would have a fight. Flora and I would be in Brazil. They'd have a fight. They'd split. i come back to a church of 18. Well, uh, the one thing that I thought was needed was to do away with the church. Just do away with it. But the building was fine. It was a $2 million building. It's a beautiful facility. And there was a, there was a church in town that needed our facility. And I went and talked to the pastor. He agreed that they might, they might be interested in coming over. I had their, their people come over and look at the facility, told them all the situations with it, and then they went back and decided that they could do that. And then I told our church that I had merged their church with another church. And somebody said, who gave you the authority to do that? Well, number one, me. Number two, you have no bylaws. You gave those up for me to come. Remember? I had to have all authority to do whatever I thought was needed to keep this church moving. And I'm doing just that. And so they, they said, okay. The leadership team was really happy with it. And so they came over and they moved the church. Our church of 18 grew overnight to a church of 500. And our facility was full once again. And I told them, you wanted children in this building? You're going to get children. A lot of them. You wanted youth in your building? They're going to be youth. And a lot of them. You want young adults in this building? You're going to get young adults. And a lot of them. And they just couldn't seem to argue with it. But they were happy with that. And now the church is a thriving church. All because I took the initiative to do something. Because I knew that those who caused trouble should be avoided. The troublemakers would be so few 
the other church would outnumber them and it would make no difference. And that's the way it worked. You may not like that procedure, but it worked. And then, uh, so Paul says, I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissension and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and, turned and turn away from them. And so Paul warns us, turn away, be careful. Get away from them. They're going to cause you trouble. And then number five, <clears throat> uh, are God's tools for victory. People need to rem you need to remember people who are God's tools for victory. And he gives us uh, Romans 16, uh, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God uh, has made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ be glory forever. Amen. So Paul talks to them about doing what is right and taking care of people. And then we have a life application principle. The life application principle is this. God will use his children to be victorious over Satan. God doesn't need our help, but he uses us for his purpose if we allow him to do so. And that's what he will do. He'll do that for us. Now, 